everyone, and welcome once again to The Open Mic, Writers in Their Own Words, the show where every episode I talk to writers about their work and the writing process. The show is available by the same name on both YouTube and via all of the major podcast platforms, and you can subscribe to either or to both so you never miss a thing. I, of course, would prefer you subscribe to both, but hey, you do what works for you. Um, aspiring writers are almost always told to write, uh, you know, write what you know or what you're passionate about. And my guest today, uh, Leslie Budowitz, has definitely followed that advice by marrying her love of cooking and writing uh, to craft wonderfully eclectic career, a, a wonderfully eclectic writing career, uh, a couple of different cozy mystery series. She writes traditional suspense thrillers, uh, which she does under her pen name, Alicia Beckman. Don't let me forget that. Uh, she's written and contributed to craft books and even cookbooks. She is a three-time Agatha Award winner, two for her fiction, and one for 2011's Books, Crooks, and Counselors, How to Write Accurately About Criminal Law and Courtroom Procedure, or that you might have guessed. She's also a lawyer. Uh, we'll get into all that in just a moment. Hello, Leslie, and welcome to the Open Mic. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure, Rich. Well, and thanks for the lovely introduction. Oh, absolutely. Well, hey, you know, that's that's quite the CV there. And I left out a lot. I, you know, I mean, very easily could have included a lot of other stuff here. But uh, you know, for folks who may not be as familiar with your work, uh, let's start out by talking a little bit about your cozies. Uh, tell me a bit about, as I noted, you have two different series. Tell me a little about a bit about uh, the Spice Shop Mysteries and the Food Lovers Village Mysteries. Sure. Um, first, let me describe what what a cozy is, because some people know the term and some don't. Uh, it is the lighthearted side of of the mystery world, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily light or fluffy. Uh, a cozy is kind of a comfort read. Uh, who doesn't love mac and cheese now and then, right? They are the descendants of Agatha Christie and Jessica Fletcher. I often describe the books as Agatha Christie with recipes. Um, I like writing them because to me, the heart of that kind of book is community. The main character is typically, though not always, a woman who typically, but not always, owns her own business. She has a strong tie to the community, although sometimes she's new to it, but deeply invested in, in joining it and being part of it and having a business, whether it's a bookstore or uh, a spice shop, a uh, retail shop of some kind, uh, uh, running a library, anything like that puts her in the heart of the community. A crime happens and it disrupts the social order of the community. There are two parallel investigations. The official investigation by law enforcement is aimed at identifying the, per the killer and bringing that person to justice and through the justice system. The parallel investigation by the amateur sleuth is the one done by our main character who knows things that maybe law enforcement doesn't know, who sees connections because she knows the people, she knows the community, she's at the heart of it. She can ask questions that and get answers that law enforcement sometimes doesn't get. Yes, it's a bit of a fiction, but uh, well, it is fiction, right? Uh, and But it, it's kind of a wish fulfillment thing in many ways too, because it is, uh, a restoration of the social order, which really, really matters. But in the context of uh, a world many of us wish we we lived in, where things like books and food and uh, uh, knitting really uh, can take center stage. <laughs> um, and by by that, I I don't mean to to suggest that those things are the heart of the story. They're not. What's the heart of the story is the effect of the crime on the community and the role of the amateur sleuth, our main character, is to bring to help the police bring that person to justice by using her skills and her position and then uh, restore that damage to the community. Well, and tell us a little bit about your two series. Sure. The Food Lovers Village Mysteries uh, are five 
full novels and a short story collection. That's the sixth book. You can see the cover behind me, Carried to the Grave. They are set in a small lakeside resort community in northwestern Montana on the way to Glacier National Park. You can guess where I live. They were great fun to write, um, in part because the main character fit a, a classic Montana story. She had left Montana as a young woman and then returned in her early 30s. And that was the same experience I had. Uh, it's a common experience here. And I really enjoyed telling that story, exploring that story through the eyes of a much younger woman. The Pike Place or the Spice Shop series are set in Seattle. My main character runs a spice shop in the famous Pike Place Market and solves crime. Um, I discovered the market and fell in love with it when I was an 18 year old college freshman at Seattle University. And then again, as a, a young lawyer, when I moved back to Seattle for a few years. And I've loved it ever since and made it my life's mission to eat my way through the place, which is easy and fun because it's always changing. Um, and the market is a really great place to set a cozy because it is a community within a community. Mm -hmm. Unlike the small town, the urban cozy, the, the city set cozy, uh, depends on having that community within a community. I was very much inspired by Cleo Coyle's Coffee House Mysteries set in Greenwich Village in New York, where the main character runs a coffee house and roastery and has connections with her, her regular clientele, with her staff, with other people in the coffee business throughout the city. And so I did something similar with Pepper and her spice shop. There are six books so far, seventh coming out this summer, and uh, two more in the works. Well, you know, uh, I'm interested in, you know, so many genres have things, uh, aspects to them that readers expect i you know i i regular um my regular audience has heard me reference this before i was told by an agent many years ago that that uh, rep mysteries if she didn't see a dead body in the first five pages she would stop reading that was mm -hmm. her expectation as a reader and as an agent um you've you've noted a lot of things that are particular to cozies are there other aspects to the cozy mystery that you really need to pay attention to as a writer because you know those those are expectations that readers will bring into looking at one of your books oh that's a great question um readers of cozies really want to get to know the secondary characters as well as the main character because they read as much for the series and for the ongoing characters as for, for the individual plots. And they want to learn something, which is, is something that I hear a lot in response to the Spice Shop books, because they talk a lot about food and spice and a lot about the history of the market and of Seattle. And your dog is about to read a book. That's a good dog. <laughs> well, I just have uh, to You might hear my cat outside the, the office door. Yes, I have to interject here for just a moment. I'm going to let you finish that that thought in a moment. But I can I know everybody who is watching this on YouTube is saying, what is going on with those dogs behind you? My dogs are always part of my show. They are always somewhere in the background, but they almost always just lay down and go to sleep. I bribe them with their with their chewies and they go to and they just lay down. Today, for some reason. They have decided they want to walk around and sniff things and, and claw at things. And I'm just I'm just going, oh, please lay down, guys. So my apologies, Leslie, that my that my, I have two English setters. They're 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 beautiful dogs, but right now they're being a pain in the butt. But I think they're finally gonna lay down here and go to sleep. So well, I think it's actually quite perfect because you were asking me about some of the elements of the cozy that readers come to expect, and yep. pets are one of them. Not every cozy main character has a pet, but most do, and that's that's a, a connection to the readers, something that they really enjoy. Aaron in my Food Lovers Village Mysteries has one cat at the beginning of the series and gets a second in the middle, and um, Pepper in the Spice Shop series gets a an Airedale Terrier named Arf in the first book. He uh, has lived in the market with a, a, uh, a market resident who is sometimes homeless and sometimes housed. And uh, at the end of the book, uh, when he is, is uh, uh, 
relieved of suspicion of murder, largely because of Pepper's efforts, he decides to go back to his family in Tennessee and she helps him with that. But it's clear to them both that Arf needs to stay in the market. And so he does. And he's very popular with readers. So I think it's great that your dogs are are sticking their noses up at, at the interview at the mention of, of cozies. Yes, um, they, they, they like to make their presence felt. You asked about uh, other aspects of mysteries yeah. that of cozy mysteries that the readership particularly likes. Uh, they like to see the main character actually at her job doing her work. And so one of the things we have have to balance is when the character is is in her shop, both my my characters run food related retail shops because while I'm obsessed with food, I have no professional cooking training and could not actually uh, write a, a series with a chef or a caterer, but I can certainly write retail. And uh, we have to balance that with the investigation. So I love having Pepper go out on deliveries or go meet with a chef at their, their restaurant. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, that was the last scene I was writing just before we, we uh, started our conversation. Well, you know, I love that one of these series is set in Pike's Place because I, I love it. Uh, you know, we have lots of friends in Seattle and uh, family, so we don't get there as much as we would prefer to. We'd like to be able to go every year. We don't really get there that often anymore. But um, my, my wife lived in Seattle for seven years because she went to UW and that's where she got her master's and et cetera. But, but it's such a unique place and it's such a Seattle place that it's so evocative of Seattle whether you've ever been there or not, you've probably seen the commercials with guys throwing the fish and all that kind of a thing. Uh, and it's so much bigger that I think than most people imagine it is when you, when you go there the first time, it's, it's a really big place. And um, so I think that's cool. I mean, I think there's up there's a, a, probably a, a wealth of good ideas there for you to write interesting stories about which you clearly do. So that that's fabulous. So many little nooks and crannies. I'm still discovering them, even though I've been wandering the place for many years. Absolutely. Of course, I don't live there now, so uh, I just go back at usually about once a year for research. And of course, by research, I mean eat. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a good place to do it. Um, I noted in the intro that you also write under your pen name, Alicia Beckman, um, which in the, and those books are more uh, straight suspense, not cozy suspense is what I mean by that. Tell me about those books as well. And do you see yourself staying in that more traditional mode going forward? So like many writers, while I love what I started out doing, I have other stories to tell too. And the perfect combination for me is to write both one, ser one cozy series and uh, standalone suspense. I love writing standalone suspense because those stories, um, well, truthfully, they're burdened less by reader expectations, uh, or maybe I should say there's a wider range of expectations that one can explore in a, a standalone than in a series. That's probably the better way to think of it. The first one, Bitterroot Lake, is, is sort of a Mary Higgins Clark uh, classic suspense. Blind Faith is the second that came out last fall. You can see the cover behind me. It's yeah. backwards, of course, but it's it's quite striking, I think. Um, and there's my cat talking. So if you hear him, my apologies. <laughs> he does not like closed doors. Um, none of us do, right? Anyway, sure. um, so Blind Faith is a multi-layered uh, novel with uh, two timelines, a contemporary cold case investigation, and then a historic timeline that works its way forward over about 35 years and intersects with the contemporary storyline. There are four point of view characters, two women we meet in their 50s, and then we meet them again as teenagers in the historic storyline, as well as uh, uh, the murder victim and the detective in the contemporary case. It was quite a challenge. You can see over my shoulder bifold closet doors. At one point, I had three rows of sticky notes in different colors uh, 
laying out the the timeline. I do outline, and I did have a regular outline, but occasionally I needed an at a glance uh, ability to see what was going on, and the doors and the sticky notes did the trick for me. I think that's one of the things that um, is so daunting. I think for uh, aspiring writers, I think so many people feel they have a story in their head or two or multiple stories. Um, but the act of sitting down and organizing that into something that is depending on your genre, somewhere from 60 to 120,000 words, depending on what you're writing. And of course, you know, fantasy and science fiction can go, can go into those mm -hmm. higher numbers. Whereas mystery stuff is somewhere generally right in the middle, 80, 90,000 words. And that is a unbelievably daunting thing for a lot of people you know me included at times and i write words for a living right i'm a reporter by trade so i i i'm always interested i don't like to always ask well are you a pantser or a plotter i mean those are those are some basic things but you touched on something that i do always find interesting which is the the rows of notes or the folders full of stuff how do you keep yourself organized so that over the course of thousands of words, you keep your story on the path that you need it to stay on to get to the end in the way that you need it to be. What's your method for keeping yourself organized as a writer? Right at the moment, I wish I knew. Um, I am <laughs> am right in the, the middle of uh, Spy Shop number eight, and I discovered that what I was writing was not in fact the middle, it was actually the two thirds point. And I had to go back and put in some things that I had left out. So sometimes it's a, a bit of a challenge, um, but I have discovered that any effort I make at organization is better for me than trying to, to use the, the opposite term, to pants it, to write it by the seat of my pants. That just does not work for me. I get too anxious and uh, I can't, I, I can't really be sure that I am hitting the points that that I need to. So um, I've got a series Bible, a, a fat three ring binder that's got my character analyses because story comes from character, right? And so that's the thing I start with. And um, because I'm writing a series, it continues. Uh, and it, that section has gotten quite fat. And then I've I've got research and outlines and other information that I keep from book to book. But for each book, you know, I will take out what's specific to that and give it its own little binder so that I can start fresh. And I did that with the standalones too, because um, although those binders aren't quite as fat, um, just because I am that kind of thinker. And I'm sure that for me, as as for you, uh, with your reporting background, I come from, from the legal world and did a lot of research and writing over the years, having to be organized, having to be able to identify what your issues and your structure was before you start writing the brief is crucial. And so those lessons have have helped me a lot. Um, I, I want to go back a little bit and talk about structure, if I may, for just sure. a minute, because I think that that, too, is one of the biggest challenges for writers, not for beginning writers, not just the organization, but the structure. There's so much that you have to learn and think about, about your storyline that doesn't actually belong on the page. And for many people, it's, you know, it's like it's the first three chapters and the book starts on chapter four because you were just telling yourself the things you need you needed to know to get the story rolling. That's perfectly fine. But those are the things that I put in the notes and the outline and hopefully not on the page. One of the best tools, I think, um, and this was particularly important for me with Blind Faith, was studying what another writer did whose, whose structure uh, was, was going to be important to mine. Um, and for Blind Faith, it was Laura Lippman's After I'm Gone. I, I think that if she were to see my copy of that book, she might want a restraining order. I mean, I've got sticky notes and a multicolored uh, highlighters and plus plus a, a handwritten outline of the book. And I really do encourage beginning writers to do that, to take a recent book of the style that you want to write that you have already read and enjoyed and then tear it apart. 
outline it, see what the writer has done, structure and pace, and so much more will become a lot more clear to you if you do that. You know, it's interesting. I I am a lover of backstory. Doesn't matter what it is, politics, sports, music, um, history. I love to know how something came about. And I, I uh, particularly love it when it comes to music. And, you know, mm -hmm. I did not know until just this last few years. I there's a few different um, music history podcasts that I got really got into, and a couple of them that are really good. And, and I never realized how many of the songs of of you know I'm I'm 59 years old, so the songs of I'll Save My Youth are the 60s, 70s, 80s, I guess. But how how common it was for songs to be based on other songs that were based on other songs and. Mm. We we tend to think of some classic song as as you know somebody sat down and wrote these things and they structured it and and, and that was you know original birthed out of their own mind and heart right well yeah sometimes but as often as not it wasn't the case at all it was actually based on another song um, some going on in fact I just I was just um, talking with somebody about the song um, House of the Rising Sun. And mm -hmm. I was telling them, you know, in over the course of my life, I have had interactions with probably a half dozen people who claim to me that, that that they had a connection to the person who wrote this song. Oh, you know, it was my great uncle or it was my grandfather's mm -hmm. best friend or or something. Right. Well, there is no credited writer for that song. And it's because it's it, it's provenance goes all the way back to a 16th century Scottish folk song. So no, your uncle did not write that song in a bar in, in the French Quarter, right? But it's a great story to tell other people, right? That's a very long-winded way of saying, you know, I think uh, it's perfectly acceptable to read what somebody else is doing in, the, in that critical way and say, how can this, not to steal their story, but to look at how they structured it, which is exactly what you're saying. I think that's tremendously positive and helpful advice for somebody you know write what you know but yes read what you want and and figure out well how did they build that art where how mm -hmm. did they build that secondary story how does how can i you know use that that framing to help tell my story and we don't tell each other that enough i don't think in the writing world that is we're all i think we're hesitant to say that oh i i you know I got an idea from reading something else. Well, that doesn't mean you're stealing a story. I mean, structure is, that's, that we should all be looking at that. Anyway. You're touching on something that I find really important. And by the way, I did not know that about the House of the Rising Sun. My husband is a musician and I will be telling him that story this evening. I did not know that it went all that, that way back. But I think we sometimes get anxious about the idea of being influenced, that it's a bad thing. Um, copying is a bad thing. Plagiarism right. is a bad thing. Influence is a good thing. Inspiration is a good thing. Learning from people who have done what we want to do is a great thing. Right. Absolutely. I, I you know, you noted you were a lawyer. Um, did you ever consider following the John Grisham, Scott Turow path and, and going into legal thrillers? No, not really you have to have just exactly the right story for that. Grisham has the ability to see an issue that is about to become really important in the legal world. And uh, it, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily true of his first couple of books, but say with The Runaway Juror and with The Pelican Grief, he was able to identify what issues were about to become huge and, and write a story that that delved into them really deeply and was really exciting. Um, I still remember having a little side bet with the, the law partner uh, when we were going to trial in, in uh, uh, hmm, must have been a civil case. I don't actually remember the case, um, but I remember this. We had a little side bet over how many of the prospective jurors would come in reading Grisham's The Runaway Juror, which was brand new at the time. And I won that bet. A good chunk of them did. <laughs> um, and Turo, you mentioned, has such an amazing grasp 
of the impact of the legal system on all the people in it, the judges, the prosecutors, the defenders, the witnesses and the parties. And he's just got such an ability to portray that and to, to make that really come alive. One of the best courtroom scenes, though, that I've ever read was not written by a lawyer. It was written by the son of a really well-known judge in Seattle, and that is David Gooderson's, uh, and all of a sudden I've lost the title, Snow Falling on Cedars. Oh. The courtroom scene there is is absolutely tremendous, and I've always wondered how much he uh, he uh, learned from listening to to his father. Uh, anyway, you, you just really have to have the right story for that, uh, that kind of book to work. You clearly love cooking. I love cooking. I'm the cook in our family. Um, how has, and, and clearly it's played a, a, a part in, uh, in your writing. Um, are there, is it, is your passion for cooking, uh, how does that contribute, I guess, to your passion for writing? Are they comparable? And are there foods or, uh, you know, recipes in your repertoire that have ever inspired a story, would be it a novel or a, a short story? Oh, that's a fun question. So I, I picked a food angle for the cozies in part because that was popular at the time and it still is popular and it, it's really a classic combination. I love how food can be used to explore character and uh, advance the story. So um, I, as soon as I say that, I can't really think of a good example. Um, but food is community. Food brings people together. And as I said earlier, cozies are, are really all about uh, the community aspect. I think that it's really important if you're a, a working writer to have another creative outlet if creativity is a big part of, of your life. Um, I know a number of writers who paint, and, and I do paint a little bit, not very often, not, not much anymore. Uh, or who quilt, which is a skill that I greatly admire and um, wrap up in my sister-in-law's quilt every night, but not a skill I have. But I love to cook, and so, and I love to eat. And so the culture that comes with the food works its way in into the stories as well. The book that's coming out this summer is called Between a Walk and a Dead Place, and it's, <laughs> it is set Humor obviously is one of those expectations in the in the cozy as well. Yeah. Uh, it's set at the Lunar New Year in Seattle, and it opens at a food walk in the Chinatown International District, which you may know. And it's a lovely, interesting, tangle town of a place. And so it was really fun to explore some of that food, have Pepper and her friends eat it, have her try to recreate some of it later, and then for myself, include the recipes for readers to be able to, to recreate that at home too. It's a, another way of telling the story. Um, in the Spice Shop Mysteries, we've got the recipes at the end. We've got a cast list at the beginning, which is a nod back to the Golden Age, and also an acknowledgement that I tend to write rather large casts. Uh, but I also use chapter epigraphs. And those three things are like additional layers uh, in addition to to the the scenes and chapters, another way to um, add to the story, I think I hope. You know, and I love the the food connection with characters. You know, I um, I read all of Walter Mosley's uh, Easy Rollins books, and mm. you know that's a theme with Easy Rollins from beginning to end. His cooking, it's it's very subtle. It's happening while he's doing something else or what have you, but. You know, there'll be a brief description of what he's throwing into this dish or what have you. And it really does give you that extra layer of visual for what kind of person this character is. Because, you know, this is a man capable of uh, of great violence. Um, he's very smart. He's very streetwise. But he's also this great cook. And it's just a, a really interesting side thing. Could the character be told without it? Uh, sure. But it's that extra bit of layering that I think makes a uh, you know a character different from other characters so I, 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 I I'm always attracted to, to things like that whether it's cooking or something else um, and as so you point out it's a nice contrast with some of the darker aspects of of the story and of his his arc yeah and, you know and I think it's a relatable thing 
for most people. Whether people like to cook or not, everybody likes to eat. So I think that's one of those things that, that's a, re a, a, a relatable thing for a reader. Um, a lot of reviews that I have read of your work uh, had high praise for your dialogue. And I agree with that. You write very crisp dialogue, which I really appreciate as a reader because bad dialogue, whether it's stilted or stiff or unrealistic or never uses a contraction, uh, you know, that, that shows how people really talk, that will cause me to put a book down. I might be very interested in the story. The plot may be fine. But if I can't get through stilted dialogue, I'll stop reading. How do you approach dialogue? Because like, as I said, clearly you're good at it. I really appreciate that compliment, Rich, because I have worked pretty hard at the dialogue. Um, I have heard other former lawyers or lawyers turned writers, I'm not exactly a former lawyer, I do still practice some, um, say they they really struggle with dialogue because in the legal world, uh, so much of how we talk is so artificial. And there's truth to that. But I also have conducted, attended, summarized hundreds, maybe thousands of depositions. And I listen to how people talk, ordinary people, not lawyers, not um, the experts we might hire in a particular case, but the witnesses, the police officers, they have their own particular lingo. Uh, they never turn on the lights of their car, they initiate their overheads and they all talk that way. So why? Well, that's part of the culture that they come from. And so it's really fascinating to me to listen to how people talk. Um, I suppose I've spent a lot of time eavesdropping in coffee shops and that helps. <laughs> um, you literally wrote the book on this. So uh, I'm going to ask you, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see writers make when they're writing about the law and courtroom procedures? And are those mistakes usually procedural or do they sometimes... Uh, you know, sticking with dialogue for a moment, do they do they also get it wrong how lawyers actually speak? Yeah. Um, most of us, when it comes to the law, are TV educated. You know, we, we have learned what we know about the law from Law and & Order, and I love the show, but I do see some, some things that uh, have crept into uh, both everyday usage and writing from that show. For example, and this is one of the biggest mistakes I see, um, always referring to the prosecutor as the DA, the district attorney. Well, in some places, it's the district attorney. Here in Montana, it's the prosecutor, the county attorney. There may be the Commonwealth's attorney. There may be some other term entirely. And so you've got to know what is the terminology in your particular, your story state, your story jurisdiction. Also, is your fictional lawyer trying cases in circuit court, superior court, district court? Uh, in New York, the basic trial court is called the Supreme Court, which is the highest appeals court in, in all the other states. So you've got to know those, terminal, those terms. And it's really not that hard to figure out. Just read the cops and courts section of, of your local newspaper or a newspaper for your story state, uh, uh, and you'll pick up on that. Um, the other one that gets me a lot is because it's easy to avoid and uh, it's Miranda warnings. People on the page and on TV will arrest a suspect and give them that warning right away. Well, that's not the requirement and it's not the, the procedure because as soon as you warn somebody, they're going to shut up, right? Um, a Miranda <laughs> warning is only required in a case of custodial interrogation. You've got to have both a person in custody and interrogation before uh, a warning is required. So those are some of the biggest things I see. <laughs> and don't tell your fictional suspect not to leave town for Pete's sake. That's tantamount to an arrest. <laughs> see i know there's always these little things and they become tropes and then you know the next person repeats it and the next person repeats it and they, you know and then it becomes one of those things that that everybody's doing right so there's a good I mean, tip probably, for everybody don't do that 
we're probably all vulnerable to doing that in areas that we don't know about. I'm sure I've messed up with reporters. I'm sure I've messed up with chefs on the page, with with people from professions where I don't know. It's hard to to realize what it is you don't know and what you have to research and and check into. So when in doubt, check it out. When in doubt. Uh, one of the truisms in life are the or the are the more chances you take, the more chances that you will get rejected, right? Um, then you know the optimist would say, well, yeah, the more chances of success too. So yeah, fair point. But rejection is such a huge part of this of anything creative, certainly with writing, and especially now with the winnowing down of of the publishing. The, the big publishing houses down to what we now call the big five, which some people I think now even call the big four. Um, so let me ask you about rejection because this, I ask everybody, this, this is one of those very consistent questions, but whether it's flat out rejection or just bad reviews, how do you deal with that when, when, you know, again, you either get punted back or somebody just says something nasty about your stuff. How do you deal with that? It's one of the biggest challenges, and and it 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 never really changes. Uh, you deal with it at the very beginning of your career, and you still deal with it, uh, as you say, from reviews or or uh, changes in the business that lead to a contract not being renewed, and all. I've been through all of that. Um, but I think that it's true any in any area where you, any art-based work. And we have to remember that the art, the writing is separate from the business, the publishing. And I think that's probably an advantage I have having come from a, a for me to understand a, a business quickly and I was a teenage bookseller though that was back in the 70s and early 80s and and the business has changed a lot since then but the combination of those two things means and realize that a lot of what's happened uh changes in publishing closing imprints that sort of thing is is the nature of the business businesses are always changing and you know I allow myself the Poor little old me moment, and then just take than others. <laughs> it all, all comes down to the work. Do you love the work? Right. Do right. you love the connection with the readers? Right. I do. I love both those things. Um, you know, I also like to ask this question a lot because I like the the the, the answers are often different. How long did it take you from when you started before you had your first success, your first book? going to print. Mm. Yeah, this is not an answer that will um, reassure the aspiring writer. I started writing the first of the four manuscripts that are tucked away in that closet behind me in 1994. Didn't get back to that first one until 96. It was shortlisted for uh, the St. Martin's uh, uh, Malice Domestic contest for uh, best first, best unpublished novel, best first unpublished novel. And that gave me a, a lot of encouragement, a, a boost that I needed because I wrote three more before I actually got a, a, a book contract. Um, I had a couple of agents. I had a lot of encouragement. It just, it, things just didn't fly. And I, I've sometimes heard people say, you know, because we've been writing since we were in the first grade, we all think, well, as soon as I start writing seriously, um, I'll be a success at it and I, I'll be able to do it. And there's so much we have to learn. And so in retrospect, I'm almost glad that those first books weren't, first manuscripts didn't become books, weren't published, because I see now uh, that while they were good practice novels, they they were just practice novels. And going through all of that, plus a few years when I, I didn't write much, um, gave me the hmm, grit, I don't know, 
and the lessons taught me the lessons I needed on the page to keep going. Yeah, this is not a business for people who don't have persistence. I mean, you just sometimes you may be the only one who believes in your work. But you, you, I mean, I, I have been told by smarter people than me, you know, the only failure is when you quit. So there you yes. go. Right? Um, getting books out there in front of people in this day and age is virtually every writer is going to be responsible now for a huge portion of their of their own marketing you know though unless again i always say this unless your name rhymes with stephen king you're probably going to do most of your own marketing um i had not done this the author speed dating bit at uh left coast where you and i met earlier this year and I, I was fascinated by it because uh, the only speed dating I'd ever done in the in the in at conferences was with agents, and that's a very different thing. This one, I thought it was really cool, a really cool way for readers or people like me who are who are you know do shows like this to meet a lot of different writers and hear about what they're they're doing, and and it was really inspiring. Um, and you know, that giant stack of books next to, to my bed in our bedroom would, would testify that it really did work, at least for me. Um, how did, how do you approach marketing? Do you work with a publicist? Do you uh, have uh, like a marketing plan that you develop on your own? How do you go about it? And maybe what what's the most fun or interesting marketing thing that you do to, to help make your books be more discoverable and to connect with fans? So uh, all of my publishers have had some sort of publicity department or outside publicists that they've hired. And I really like working with those people. Some houses, some publishers are um, more aggressive with that. Than, than others, but I've discovered that when you ask, uh, well, can you do this? Um, you're much more likely to get it than if you don't ask. And so I have sometimes asked for things that um, are not typical. And because I have made the ask, uh, I've gotten a little bit of, of extra help. Uh, I have not ever hired a private publicist myself. Uh, I am not really sure how whether that would would be a big boost or not, but I certainly have learned from watching a lot of other people for a long time to see what has worked for them. I do create my own uh, publicity plan for each book. I've got a template basically that I use that starts at six months out from publication and works its way forward. And I look at it and see, okay, what do I wanna do for this? What do I wanna do for this? This one is gonna be different. This book is different from the last one. And how how can I uh, customize it for a particular book? And that helps keep me on track. Going back to your your question about organizing, um, it's organizing the the uh, marketing side as well as the the creative side. And I think really that um, using your creativity in your marketing is something people sometimes forget. They get really focused on doing the things that everybody else has done, and um, that's okay, but those things have all been done and they may not be the best way or the most fun way to reach your particular readership. Uh, one of the most fun things I do is Mystery Lovers Kitchen, which is a, a group blog, mysteryloverskitchen.com. There are currently 12 authors. And so every two weeks, for me, it's the first, third and fifth Tuesday, it's my day and I post a, a little prequel, a little introduction, head note to a recipe, then the recipe and illustrated uh, uh, instructions on how to make it. Around launch time, the recipe will relate to, to the new book, but other times of the year could be anything that I've that I've made and enjoyed and think that uh, the readers would be interested in too. And so that's a lot of fun. It's that food connection and it's a one-on-one -on -one connection. I think one of the things that stops people sometimes in, in marketing and um, promotion is um, they, they get stuck in the idea that they hate it, that they hate always talking about themselves and talking about their books. Well, yeah, that's, Nobody really wants you to constantly be trying to push them to buy your book. But if you talk about the things that you're both interested in, 
if you talk about food or Montana or Seattle or historic buildings, um, then find people who are interested in those things, then it's a lot more fun for you and it's a lot more fun for them. And you're going to bond over that connection. Will the, the person be more likely to want to read your book? Well, you hope so, um, because you've shown them that there are things in it that interest them. I, kudos. I cannot um, say kudos enough for that, because one of the things that I notice with writers on social media, um, and I'm not going to mention any names, but I see this a lot and I always cringe where the only communication this writer will have with people is buy my book, buy my book, yeah. buy my book. And I always think, man, you know, there there is absolutely nothing in that that will make me want to buy your book. Right. I I just really wish that pe more people had that that thought of, you know, if I connect with my reader on a on a more human level and get them to think something good about me and there's something interesting and fun or whatever about me that might make them more inclined to buy my book. And I, I always just think, man, I don't know who's advising you, but I hope you're not paying them money because that's, I I will never buy a book based on just seeing, you know, Twitter pitches or what have you. That That's uh, not going to happen. Um, I always like to end on what I hope is a fun question, what I mean to be a fun question. Um, if you've seen any of my other interviews, you know, what I will do is I offer you a choice of one of the following three people. Let's say I had the magical power to put you together with one of these three people for, in your case, let's say a nice meal where you can and a good, really good bottle of wine to talk about writing or whatever it is they do. Which of these three people, which one of these three people would you choose and why? I mean, the options I'm going to give you are, of course, the great French the, not the French chef, but I think that was the name of her show, though. Julia Child. We all know who Julia Child is. Uh, the great actress Myrna Loy. Mm. Uh, the very famous uh, stuntman, daredevil, evil can evil. <laughs> I probably don't have to tell you those last two are Montana natives. I don't think yes. it was. Yeah. Uh, without a doubt, Julia Child. Um, I actually had seen Evil Knievel do one of his stunts when I was a teenager. And it was so darn scary that I don't think I'd want to be anywhere near the man. Uh, <laughs> although I'm sure he was was very nice in real life. Uh, but yes, Julia Child. I think she just had so much uh, joie de vivre. She just loved living. She loved eating and drinking and being around people and cooking for them and taking care of them and talking to them. Um, and and she, from all accounts, uh, was very interested in the people around her, too. And so I think she would be a lot of fun. She also, according to one of the biographies, uh, to a biography of her that I read, um, she did not always have to be fed a fabulous French meal. Um, she would eat a grilled cheese sandwich or mm -hmm. catch up on saltines. Yeah, she seemed to have... Um... She seemed to have that thing that inspired people to really like her and to really want to be around her and appreciate um, her as a cook, of course, but as a person. Because the, the people, you know, the the Jacques Pepins and all the people that have spent time around her absolutely adored her, right? And I think at the end of our lives, wouldn't that be the thing we would want on our gravestone is that, you know, hey, people really like this person. You know, not what not what I did in my life, but that I was somebody that people wanted to be around. I think that's that's the thing. So for me, anyway. Um, well, Leslie, I will say we made it through um, interference from my dogs, um, interference from the uh, lawn maintenance guys who showed up right at the end here. Um, maybe your cat. Uh, <laughs> Every 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 endeavor comes with with a challenge once in a while, but uh, it was a fascinating conversation, certainly for me anyway. I hope so for you. Really appreciate you making time to come on the show and and uh, share all of your great insights. I hope anyone who uh, is thinking about writing, whether it's cozies or traditionals or anything else, um, I hope that you uh, listen to some of the things Leslie had to say here today because I think it'd be very very helpful for you. So, um, thank you, Rich. It's been a delight. 
Absolutely. Uh, the pleasure was all mine. Um, I will leave folks with the same things I always do, which is please, if you haven't done so, hit subscribe, whether it's on YouTube or on the podcatcher that you're using. It really does help other people find the show. If you uh, subscribe and if you uh, leave me a nice review, that'd be great. Remember, you're not necessarily reviewing me. You're reviewing my guests. So please, whether if you think I'm an idiot, that's fine. But our, my, the guests are always great. Please leave them a good review. And um, the other thing that I always leave you with, and I mean it with all my heart, Tomorrow, it is not promised to any of us. So please make today count. Until next time, I'm Rich Eisen. My guest has been Leslie Budowitz. This has been The Open Mic. We'll see you next time around. Take care.